right. All right. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to project stream number 15. I actually checked what number we're on this time before starting today. Um, and I'm actually starting right at noon. So that's awesome. Uh, usually there's some kind of technical difficulty. I don't want to jinx that. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and fix some formatting stuff real quick. Um, and then I'm going to explain what this formatting is <laughs> and what we're going to do today. So today we are, um, let me close this tab. Thank you. Um, we are going to be doing some research. Um, yeah, so this project stream that my project currently is doing some research. Now, normally I like to do my initial research on paper, um, cause I'm weird, I guess. Um, uh, but, <laughs> uh, barring that, uh, I did want to show sort of my process for doing sort of philological research on a topic, um, and how I organize that research. So what I'm doing is I'm making a little Google doc. This is kind of what I would usually do on paper and then transfer to a Google doc eventually. And that act of transferring it helps me like sort of process the information a second time. Um, but it's fine to also just use a Google doc or whatever, um, word processor you prefer. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this a subtitle. Um, yeah, not a subtitle, uh, like a section really. Um, and I'm going to fix the formatting and I'm, I'm going to do the spacing stuff later. Um, maybe I don't want all this extra spacing there. All right. Um, the reason I'm even bothering to do titles and sections instead of just, you know, increasing the font size is because on Google Docs, it lets you have this little um, legend thingy on the side that has, um, yeah. So as you can probably see in the title now, um, we are going to be doing research on the goddess Epona today. Because um, I, I want to write something about Epona. Um, and... Uh, I want to do some research on that first, obviously. Um, compile some stuff. There's some stuff I've read about Epona before, and I have thoughts on it, um, but I'm trying to put all of that aside. Judgment and thoughts and personal experiences and opinions aside, I want to see what um, sources I can find on Epona um, and compile those. Um, and then later when I'm analyzing and doing all that, that's kind of where my personal opinions and stuff can come back in. So um, what I've done is I've titled the document, obviously, and then I have a, a subsection and each section is gonna be a different source that I use. And I usually put like a little line between these two. I'm gonna do that. Um, just visually, it separates it out. Um, and I am gonna make this much smaller. This does not need to be size 20. There we go. <laughs> All right. Um, because then later when I'm going, when I'm processing the research, I could easily switch to like, oh, what did this person say? What did this person say? What did this source say? Um, so um, yeah, we're just going to be doing research on opponent. Now, before I actually get started with the research, I wanted to give some updates. So next week, there will not be any stream. Um, I have some family related events happening then and I can't really do my stream so we're gonna pause that and we'll come back the following week the following week um, so that will be April um, April 8th uh, we will be returning to the conlang I started last week um, working more on that conlang um, and then the week following will probably be another journal with me I'm pretty sure that's what we're doing then. Um, I'm going to do some different things in my journal again. So that's sort of what things look like. The other announcement I guess I have is um, I announced this last week as well, but I have a Patreon now and that will be linked in the description of the YouTube upload of this. And you can find that if you're on Twitch. If you just go to my channel info, uh, you'll see a link to my Patreon. I also have a buy me a coffee where you can commission a short old English poem or Old Norse poem. Um, if you'd like something else, 
you could talk to me. Um, I could probably do a gothic poem or something to, um, something else as well. Um, or just a modern English poem if you want poetry. Um, or just a one-time um, donation to the channel that you can do there. Um, all, all of that is linked on Twitch and on YouTube, and it will be in the description of the video as well. Um, so yeah, those are my updates, and now we can actually get started. I'm going to recenter the screen here a little bit. I think we're good. Okay. Um, so we're going to get started with this research. So, um, oh, I see someone's in the chat. Okay, hello. Um, all right. So um, how I'm going to start with this is I want to just start with, like, who is this goddess, Epona? Um, so I'm just going to go to um, Britannica, I believe. Britannica has uh, a an article on Epona. So I'm going to go there. So here we are at uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, so before I even do anything, like before I even do a single thing, I am going to note what source I'm looking at. Um, why can't I spell today? Britannica. Um, and do we have a date for this article? Last updated article history. I'm going to open that a new tab. Um, Uh, summer 2016 and it was last updated in twenty seventeen, okay. Add a new website. Add new website ancient origin to kill the goddess opponent that rode swiftly across the ancient Roman Empire. Is that are those sections here? I'm not quite sure what's going on with that. What does that even really mean? Um, okay. The editors of Encyclopedia Britannica are the authors. Overseas subjects. Okay, can you tell me who they are? No. Okay. It's been a while since I've actually had to cite um, Britannica, <laughs> so I forget how they format things sometimes. Um, all right but um, I will write Britannica. And usually what I do is I put my little citation format here. Um, like I'll put author and then year uh, title, if it's an article of article and then book or site or whatever it is. And then whatever other information would be useful to find the source. Um, and if it's a website, I try to link it as well. Um, but I'll do that. I usually do that first, but I'm I'm forgetting how I would even go about citing Britannica off the top of my head. Um, so that's a problem for later me, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna link it and do that later. So I'll just say source and link it. Okay, cool. Now this is where I start taking notes, and I usually do bullets um, to start with if I'm gonna be paraphrasing, and then I'll sort of indent actual quotes. Um, so let's go back to the article and read it. So it says, Epona, goddess who is patron of horses and also of asses and mules. Epo is the Gaulish equivalent of the Latin equo, equo, horse. Um, yeah, equus is the word for horse in Latin, and it's epos in Gaulish. And then the ona here, ona is actually ona with a long a short O, long A, is a really common ending on like certain feminine titles and names, um, and it's onos, if it's masculine. Um, it kind of just is either like a personalizing or augmentative um, sometimes as well, like the great whatever I'm attaching it to, so it would be sort of like, it could just be like, she who is the horse, or it could be like the great horse feminine. Um, both meanings similar enough and make sense for who she is. Preaching gratis of horses and other, um, you know, beasts that you ride. Um, the majority of inscriptions and images bearing her name have been found in Gaul, Germany, and the Danube countries. So those would be places where I would want to look for um, artifacts, if I want to include this, which I would like to. Um, of the few that occur in Rome, most have been found on the site of the barracks of the Equites Singulares. Um, 
and we can open those that up too if we want to look into that but um i feel like i've written about them before and i and i know who they are but um it might be good to have a source on them too um Britannica might be able to point us towards those the equites this plural of equus is a horseman or um this gets used for knight sometimes in medieval latin equus which is fun um because you know riding a horse a knight originally a member of the cavalry and later of a political and administrative class as well as the equestrian order in uh, Rome so it was pre so um, the inscriptions and images of her that are found in Rome are mostly in barracks of those um, horsemen which makes sense if she's the patron of horses um, a foreign imperial bodyguard recruited mainly at the uh, from the Batavians yeah um, there are uh, quite a few um, goddess cults that are mostly associated with the Batavians, which is kind of interesting to see. Um, but yeah. Um, anyways, so that's what we know about where we'll find um, inscriptions of her. Then we have the cult of Epona does not appear to have been introduced into Rome before imperial times, when she is often called Augusta and invoked on behalf of the emperor and of the imperial house. The Romans used to place the image of the goddess, which was crowned with flowers on festive occasions, in a sort of shrine in the center of the architrave of the stables. In art, she is generally represented seated with her hand placed on the head of the accompanying horse or ass. Okay, um, I would like to find some images of her. Um, maybe to include when I write uh, my article. But I'm going to start by just taking in this information um, and I'm going to try to synthesize that into bullet points. Now, usually when I do research, I have and, and I am logging into a Google Doc or something like that instead of just on paper, which is what I usually do. Um, if I am doing that, I usually split screen so I can look at both simultaneously. But I'm going to tr um, actually, you know what I might do? Could I do split screens? I know it's possible with OBS, but it's going to be a hassle to reconfigure it. And I don't feel like I'm doing that right now. So I'm just going to try to read and then remember what I just read. Um, or wait, there's a much easier solution here. I just copy and paste this into my Google Doc <laughs> just so I could look at it at the same time. Okay, so I'll just put it here. Okay, um, and I'm going to take notes on it. So, okay, so Epona is patron of horses, asses mules and then their etymological note is it's gaulish um wait, why am i italicizing gaulish um, gaulish epos oh, well they say apple but i know it's epos the s is the nominative ending in gaulish um is horse cognate they say equivalent but it's cognate to the latin um uh they say equal it's equus. Equo is like the root, but equus is the again the nominative case. Um, they didn't say cognate. I'm just gonna say like compare. Um, I don't want to say something they didn't say in um, in their text and attribute it to them. All right. Um, okay. The majority of inscriptions. Right. Okay. So we're gonna be looking in um, inscriptions. I'm just gonna say artifacts. Artifacts. Um, Gaul. Germany, Danube, just countries along the Danube, and um, Rome, especially Equites Singularis Barracks. Okay. And if I want to include stuff about them, um, I can look for sources on the Batavian Imperial Bodyguard. Um, okay. So the Cult of Epona, okay, not appear to have been introduced into Rome before imperial times. So that's a roundabout way of saying that she was introduced. She was probably introduced in imperial times. Um, so um, appears to have been, I don't want, I'm not gonna quote, okay. Maybe I will just quote this part.
will I include this quote? No, but I just I don't feel like paraphrasing that right now. Um, and then uh, they used to place the used to place the image of the goddess, which was crowned with flowers on festive occasions. Okay, that's interesting too that they would crown her when it was like a festive occasion. Um, okay, I will all say also called Augusta invoked on behalf of the emperor and of the imperial house. Okay. And then um, it says, okay, so she's usually seated. Mm, okay, they say generally, generally seated with hand on horse. on the head of horse crowned with flowers on festive occasions okay this is actually pretty poor paraphrasing that I'm doing here I should condense this a lot more but um, I'm, I'm just including some of their verbiage too um, I'm because when I actually write this and whatever I include here is going to be condensed a ton because this is just one source here. Um, in general, she is seated with her hand placed on the head. Okay. Um, shrine in the center of the architrave of the stable. And the architrave, let's take a look at that. The, um, I hope they have a picture. That's why I'm looking at it. Um, yeah, so it's like this sort of area um, of a state in a stable. It'll look different. So um, when you have a, um, how do I explain this? Let's look closer here. Um, when you have like pillars there, okay, cool. They have this is the architrave. So it's like where you, you, top of your pillar meets the roof. There's usually like in a stable, it's usually going to be wood. Um, this is the architrave. Um, and so what they're saying is that inside of a stable, where there'll usually be you know beams going up, um, or not, they're not called beams when they're vertical. Um, The, the sort of wooden supports between those where those meet the roof there's like usually going to be a like big piece of wood there before you go to the, like the higher part of the wall that is the architrave and so there'd be like a little thing where they'd have like a little sort of place where she's sitting up here but just picture all of this as wood <laughs> um okay so that's Oops, did not mean to close that. Um, that is, that's what we learned from Britannic. I don't think there's anything more. Is there, are there, are there like links to other sources? No, it's just, we just got Mule below. <laughs> the algorithm is saying like, oh, you might want to also read Mule. Um, okay, actually let's look at site because I want to see how they would have it be cited, okay. Editors of Encyclopedia. Yeah, I want to like see what APA looks like. Invalid date. Love to see that. Um, is that what it says with MLA too? With MLA, you can just put. Oh yeah, no, it says invalid date as well. There's probably some kind of error going on here. Um, yeah, I've got the link. Um, the way that I usually cite things in my articles is um, sort of a hybrid of AP and MLA. Um, the way that they're treating the like it's the first name. <laughs> so funny here. They they really got to update their <laughs> whatever whatever like program they wrote to um, create the citation it, it's just treating the word the like it's the first name in the editors of, of Encyclopedia Britannica and it's treating Britannica like a surname um, yeah so usually I go author and then date 
you know, parentheses, and then I put, you know, the, the article, which would be, um, oh, it's, it's italicized because it's a name in a foreign language, I think is why it shouldn't be italicized usually, um, in APA, and then it's in quotes, and I'm like, I usually put it in quotes, um, my, my citation is kind of like a weird hybrid of APA and MLA, um, and then, yeah, this is Chicago, yeah, so, if that's how they want to be cited, <laughs> according to their little program, um, I'm going to go up and do that citation now because it's going to bother me if I don't do it. Um, so I'm just going to say, editor's encyclopedia is not, I feel like that's given when you're looking at Encyclopedia Britannica. So I'm just going to say, I'm going to start with the article title because that's what I usually do when there's no... Sorry, the reason I'm doing this inside of the word source is because I want it to be part of the hyperlink. Um, there we go. Uh, oh, and I should start, and I don't have a date to put either. I'm going to just say Epona, period, Britannica, I guess Encyclopedia Britannica. I think people know what that means when I just say Britannica, but I think I would, I would probably put Cyclopedia. I'm really not being able to spell today. Um, Encyclopedia Britannica doesn't use that, um, oh no, yeah, they, no, they do use the British spelling, okay. I'm going to use an ash, even if they don't, it's more fun. Um, and this part doesn't need to be hyperlinked, I don't think. I, th I think I'm just going to hyperlink the word epona. There we go. Cool. Um, yeah. It links, so that's all someone needs to know to be able to find it. <laughs> Just go to Encyclopedia Britannica and search for opponent or click the link. Um, I don't like my links to be underlined. Okay. So, um, that's what we learned from Britannica. Um, I'm going to get rid of this just direct quote. Okay. Um, and I'm going to put another line here. I also don't feel like messing with formatting, so I'm just going to copy Britannica. No. Um, and I'm just going to put my second source here. Okay. Um, so now I can, you know, go between what Britannica says and what anyone else says. Um, yeah. Cool. Now, the next place I want to look, uh, I'll keep Equus open. Um, and what I'm doing since I'm in one window i don't know if you can see this yeah you can't see my tabs uh, you don't want to see my tabs but what i'll do is um i have i had my like google doc at the farthest like the furthest left the beginning sort of of my list of tabs and then as i finish looking at a source um if i have any any like links that i don't want to close any tabs that i don't want to close um i'll just drag google docs to like say that i've passed that now but i'll keep those open um, I don't need to keep the opponent one open because I like have a link on my um, on my document, but I want to keep this Equus one open just in case I want to try to find other sources um, to include on it. Um, so I'm going to keep that open for now, just as a reminder to myself that I might want to do that. Um, so I've dragged my Google Docs over. So the next thing I wanted to look at was the World History Encyclopedia. Um, which I think that was one of the things that um, Britannica was saying. They, um, like, on their, like, article history, I think that's one of the things they were um, referencing. But, yeah, this is worldhistory.org. Um, so world history is my second source. Um, and let's see if they're better when it comes to giving me... Um, <laughs> Bizdent is the user, and I have a date too, 2012. Hmm. They also did an article. They they've done the article on Epona and the article on Gaul. Okay. Um, this is not necessarily a source I would want to be primarily citing <laughs> in my article because uh, it's just a user on WorldHistory.org. But um, they seem to be really interested in this topic. Um, and I might link to the user. <laughs> um, so my author is bizdent, lowercase b, 
and it's 2012. That's when they wrote the article. If my author is like a web user, I would link the author <laughs> if I can. Um, and then the article is called Epona. <laughs> um, okay, and I'll link the article as well. Um, and it's worldhistory.org. Okay, cool. Um, and again, that's kind of all anyone needs to be able to find it. Um, and let's start some bullet points. I forget the hotkey for bullet points, so I'm just, oh, it's control shift eight, okay. Now let's see what they have to say here. We actually have a picture here, that's nice. Um, okay, I'll close BizDent. Um, okay, so Epona, was a Celtic goddess, and they linked to Celt here. Good, because using this term without more context is kind of tricky, um, what you mean when you say Celtic. Um, all of these areas that were listed in Britannica historically had people who spoke, who likely spoke Celtic languages, Gaul being like a primary one. They spoke a Gaulish, which is a Celtic language. Um, Germany had a lot of different Celtic speaking tribes um, and along the Danube as well. Um, and there's evidence uh, evidence for that in a lot of ways um, that there's Celtic language speaking people there. Uh, but calling so calling her Celtic, that's why I think I think it's justifiable to call her Celtic. I'm not saying it's not, but Celtic is a tricky term sometimes because people people view Celtic in a lot of different ways. Um, and not just as a linguistic grouping, but the linguistic grouping is all we can really say, like the, the archeological and linguistic grouping that we tend to call Celtic. Um, but it's not an uncontroversial thing to say. <laughs> um, her name contains an allusion to the horse. Allusion. Okay, that's an interesting way to phrase that, but yeah, uh, her name has the word horse in it. Um, yeah, epos means horse, and the suffix ona affix simply means on. I disagree. Um, I disagree. I'm not, I'm not, my specialization is not in Celtic languages, but I have a lot of experience with Celtic languages, and I'm very, fairly certain that this suffix does not mean on. <laughs> um, sorry, BizDent, I'm not trying to dig into you, I'm just, I want to know your source for that. Um, Epona is the patron goddess of mares and foals. Okay, um, this is not quite what Britannica said, so they're saying something different here. Um, <laughs> mares and foals. Okay, what makes you say that? I want to know what makes you say that. Okay, the oldest information about the about the Gallic goddess. Now we're calling her Gallic because she's found like in Gaul among other places. Um, Gallic goddess of horses is found in Juvenal. Okay, satires. Um, this is a ancient Roman writer. Um, he writes, Iurat solam eponam anthakies olida ad praesepia pictas. Okay. We can also find another text mentioning Epona in Minucius Felix, Italianus. Um, Okay, nisi quod vos et totos asinos in stabulis, wait no, it's asinos, I think that was longer, in stabulis cum vestro vel sua epona consecratis. Um, I think it's interesting that they're not translating the Latin for the audience here. <laughs> um, the known inscriptions about epona were excavated all around the territories corresponding to ancient Gaul and Germany but also on the Danubian provinces and even at Rome. The many inscriptions were often signed by soldiers and found close to settlements, which seemed, which seems to suggest that the inscriptions reveal, especially in the East, not an indigenous cult, but a military cult. 
Um, I think what they mean when they say that is that this isn't a cult of the places where they're found in the Danubian province, but of the cult of the military who are stationed there at those, in those provinces by the Roman Empire. Um, all right. Uh, Rosmania is, I guess, the photographer there. Um, okay. And this is Epona. They're not saying what, which art, like, which artifact is this? Like, where is this found, etc. They're not really giving information. Um, which is fair. I, I wanted to see what World History Encyclopedia would say, um, because they are a very, like, beginner-friendly source, but they're also not a source I recommend for, like, detailed information. I would not usually actually cite them for anything um because of the the sort of user submitted format it's kind of like wikipedia in the sense that like you can't necessarily trust everything that's going to be on the article um epona occupied an important place in the gallic religion because the horse itself was important in the life of the gauls we can remember how the gallic cavalry had destabilized the roman legions during the conquest the veneration of the goddess logically then persisted in the army, yet everything suggests the common people adored her in rural areas. There remains, unfortunately, almost no trace of an official cult of Epona in large cities. Except Rome. Um, Epona's appearance in art varies in function depending on the origin of each representation. With few exceptions, Epona is always dressed and found in the presence of horses. Um, apart from these animals, she is typically shown alone and sometimes depicted as celibate. Oh, oh, different meaning of the word celibate. Sorry, that's good. <laughs> I was reading that wrong. Um, while these features are found on all depictions, positions, and attitudes of Epona and her horses vary depending on where they were found. With few exceptions, Epona is found dressed and found in the presence of horses. Yeah, I mean, I think that makes sense. Um, the first type of representation found in northeastern Gaul and the Rhine region shows the goddess seated on a mare, sometimes accompanied by a foal. Carried by, ho by a horse, she can act as a funerary symbol. On some steles, um, it is uh, clear that she evokes the journey of the soul to the underworld. Representation of a woman to symbolize the soul of the deceased is consistent with folklore of ancient religions. You're going to have to be more specific than that. I don't disagree. I don't. I'm not resistant to the idea that she can be evoked like as sort of a psychopomp esque figure. I don't see that as being beyond the scope of possibility at all. Um, but that what she's wearing is consistent with folklore of ancient religions you got to be more specific than that to make a claim like that um she can act like especially if you say she can act as a funerary symbol instead of she may have acted as a funerary symbol because of these sort of tenuous links um i think you need more detail to make a claim like that um or at least say who else has suggested this unless if, if this is your original suggestion in this article i would want to see more more detail <laughs> backing that up in the second type of representation the goddess is surrounded by horses which she sometimes feeds such representations are found mostly in central gaul there is yet another way to represent epona she may be lying on a horse half naked as found in allery uh allery uh, Alare, um, burgundy um i was not able to read that for a second <laughs> All the, like, the E's were blending together in my eyes. Um, her attributes are usually the cornucopia or peg. She is sometimes accompanied by a dog and is sometimes accompanied by gods, goddesses, or spirits, local Mars, Hercules, or Sylvanus. Depicted, uh, depictions are frequently found. Celtic wagon. Okay, cool. Um... When we have to study a Celtic deity, it is often useful to compare it with what is known of the Celtic tradition, which has left mythological writing in Ireland. Okay, so we're zooming out to sort of like a pan-Celtic language-speaking area's view here. Um, this also means we're forward fasting like a thousand years, <laughs> or several centuries at the very least, but more like in the area of a thousand years later when we're looking at medieval Irish writings um, and Wales. 
as well. Even though the recordings of mythological Celtic Ireland start at the beginning of the Middle Ages and it applies mainly to the British Isles, it is sometimes useful to try to establish links with the old Celtic traditions in which these stories come from. Yeah, um, comparative mythologists and linguists do this all the time. Um, we just need to be aware that there's like a big gap here. Um, Epona is often closer to the goddess Rhiannon Cymric. Um, the name derives from the, the Celtic word Rigantona, meaning Great Queen, yeah. Rigantona. Rhiannon. Um, Rhiannon. Uh, appearing in the Mabinogi of Pwll. In this kind of Arthurian romance, it is said... In this kind of Arthurian romance, it is said that it is possible. I think they're saying kind of as Arthurian because Arthur plays a role, but it's not it's not quite like focused on Arthur and his knights kind of vibe. It's just he's, he's there in the story. Um, it is said that it was possible to catch her when she rode on horseback and she traveled so swiftly as she traveled so swiftly, so, so swiftly. She entertained guests at Harzlech singing at meals. Priyannon was married with Pulch, um, and Manawidan. She did also. She may also have had a function to accompany the dead here, too. Um, sorry, I'm trying to like remember the story and if that even tracks. Maybe. Um, YouTube video from World History's YouTube channel. Thirteen minutes about ancient Celtic. Druids and Peter. Okay, interesting. Huh. Okay. Um, there are s certainly similarities between Epona and Trianon, such as their attachments to horses, their role as a companion to the dead, assuming the idea of her having a connection to the dead, um, then that would be a connection, um, but you'd have to establish that for Epona first. <laughs> um, uh, but there are also differences in scope. Yeah, the goddess Epona was single, while Trianon, seen as the queen, was married. Also, Epona was especially adored by the Limes, while Hrianon, um existed in Celtic literature, especially, especially some Britain. Yeah, mostly Britain, because we're looking at Welsh stuff with Hrianon. Um Thus, if there are undeniable similarities between the characters, it would be wiser not to equate them. Well, yeah, certainly not equate them. Um, okay, translation. We want people all over the history. Help us translate the article. Um, maybe later. <laughs> uh, okay, interesting stuff. I don't know. Okay, there's some things I want to take notes on for like things I want to look into more. Okay, um, sorry. I, I, I actually didn't like mute my phone, but blowing up right now for some reason <laughs> um i usually don't get that many texts on a saturday but today apparently people want to talk okay so um i i want to note some things that i want to some of the things that they mentioned that i want to like double check <laughs> like look into um okay the juvenile quote and the um nucleus felix quote i want to keep i want to grab these for later um might be interesting to include. All right. Um, oh yeah. I wonder what did, what did they say about the oldest information comes from Juvenal. So I'm gonna write that in here. Oldest info. Um, Um, and I'll, I'll do my Latin translation of that later for myself. Uh, don't feel like doing that right now. I'm not in the mood. <laughs> um, but some of the rabbit holes. Okay, mares and foals. That, I guess we can see when we look at more artifacts of her. Um, there was something else that was said here that I wanted to look into. So, um, important place in the Gallic religion.
Okay. Um. And the other thing, there are a couple other things that are like, hmm, I want to look into that some more. Um. Her being dressed versus undressed, right? They they brought that up a couple times. Um, Epona is always dressed, with few exceptions, and found in the present forces. Almost always dressed, and with horses. And like they, they try to emphasize the idea that like she's she's not married and that she's always appearing by herself. Like well no, that's not true, because they also say that she shows up with um Mars, Hercules, um, or Sylvanus. Um uh sometimes appears with Mars, Hercules. And still I want to see if I can find any of those artifacts. Um, among others. And then the half naked cornucopia or peg. Okay. Um, in her depictions. And then there's like the psychopomp angle that I wanted to look into as well. Funerary symbol. Okay. Um, so that's world history. That's kind of all I have. Uh, all I really want from there is like those avenues of things I want to look into. Uh, funerary symbol, particularly. Um, I should have copied this down too. See, the reason I'm copying this instead of just using the like section button is because then it's going to give it like, by default, Google Docs is going to give it like weird spacing characteristics and I don't want that. So I'm just, I've already dealt with the spacing with this and so I can just copy it with its formatting. Um, my next source is a really cool source. I'm very happy that someone actually shared this, um, not to me directly, but I was in a chat where this was shared um, by uh, uh, I think it was Gaulish polytheists yeah Gaulish polytheists I think that's where it was going down it was a conversation conversation with a uh, contemporary Gaulish polytheist um, which I thought would also be an interesting place to look obviously because they are people who would be venerating this goddess today um, um, and so they would likely be aware of sources that I could look for, for like the historical um, information about this goddess. So um, the next place is actually a website called epona.net. Uh, why isn't it typing? Okay, there we go. Epona.net. It's someone just com compiled everything they could find about Epona um, onto one place. And this is it. Epona.net, a scholarly resource. Um, I, I can't remember who actually made this. Oh, there we go. Um, it's on the bottom. Oh, and we got lots of references too. Love that they have work cited. Um, okay, so Nantonos and Kethu. Okay. Let's see who these people are. This looks like a Gaulish name, and this looks like a Welsh name. <laughs> so let's look at these people. Uh, this is a blog that no longer exists. Okay, goodbye. And this is someone's WordPress. And yeah, Kefin means horse, I'm pretty sure, in modern Welsh, and that's why. Horses. Okay. So, whoever runs this blog <laughs> loves horses, which I guess explains their interest in compiling information about Epona. That's awesome. Um, we love to see it. Um, so, Let's go to epona.net and see what we can find here. So, depictions of Epona. The main source of indirect evidence about Epona are several hundred statues, statuettes. Okay, interesting that this flower moves with the page, but this flower is part of the background. Okay, um, this is probably they have, probably have like a mane here, and then this is like 
these are part of it and it scrolls up but then this is background interesting okay um or maybe this is a sidebar anyways depictions of epona the main sources of indirect evidence about Epona are several hundred statues statuettes uh base reliefs and painted depictions of her a few Epona representations are made of bronze the majority are stone based reliefs in a variety of sizes molded pipe clay eponas are also fairly common one opponent is made out of wood and there's a link i want to see this picture show me the pictures <laughs> oh small side saddle of opponent an oak found in rubbish trip it, it was just a link to the bottom of the page um i should have saw seen that in the url huh um uh Okay, there's no link. <laughs> that makes me sad. Okay, um, let's go back. Okay. Um, depictions of Pona may be classified into two main types, side saddle and imperial. There's also a possible third type with a cart. These types are illustrated and discussed below. Okay, good, there will be illustrations. I know there's this one already. Okay, side saddle type. The first main type is the side saddle type. Um, a woman sitting sideways on a horse. Oh, I just noticed we're on the depictions page. <laughs> we're not even in the introduction. But honestly, I'm glad to start there because that's what we haven't been seeing so far, our depictions. Um, I, I want to look at depictions, have more depictions of her to get more of an idea of like what we're looking at with her inscriptions and stuff. Um, we'll look at inscriptions in a second. Okay, so she's side saddle here. She wears a long garment that reaches her feet. This is pretty great. This bronze from Champollay. Um, I'm guessing this is the person who took the picture. Or maybe this is, I don't I don't know if there's a city with this name. Um, Epona and her mare are cast as separate items. Her empty right hand seems to be shaped as if she once held an item such as a patera. Okay, yeah, maybe. Um, Okay. Okay, I think this is who took the picture. Um This is cute. This is a really cute um bronze cast of her. I like it. Okay. Examples from Ghana uh show this example from Ghana shows the side saddle posture, high stepping walk, and billowing cloak. Yeah, you can kind of see it. She's sitting side saddle on the horse. Um, oh, yeah, okay. Um, another side saddle example from Casto um, depicts Epona in local dress with a long saddle, cloth, and bridle. Um, visible. Carries around object, perhaps fruit or loaf. Yeah, the World History one talked about cornucopias. Um, so this is interesting. She's holding like bread or some kind of fruit or something. All right, another side saddle one. That this one's harder to make out, but um, gravestone, gravestone. In this example from a necropolis. Okay, that kind of maybe gives credence to the idea about her being involved in funerary rites. Um, sometimes, especially in representations in the Idui area, the mare is accompanied by a foal standing, lying down, drinking from its mother, or feeding from the patera. Um, this example with a sleeping foal is from Alare. Um, I think that's what they were talking about on the other page. Um, the reclining pose of the goddess in this picture, picture also suggests an identification with the nymphs of springs. Okay, yeah, because nymphs like to be like sort of like lying down in a lot of their depictions. Um, that it's a possible connection. Um, Mass-produced molded figures were made from white pipe clay, inexpensive, portable, and easily replaced. They were probably used in domestic lararia. Um, and while traveling, so like to be used in like a household cult kind of um, context. This example is from Toulon sur Allier. Um, okay, also in Auvergne. All right, so that's the that's the side saddle type, and then we have imperial type. Um, this is more like the one we saw on that last page. The second type shows a woman seated, occasionally standing. So she's usually seated, 
um, again facing the front. She is in between two or more horses, typically either two or four, which often turn their heads towards Epona or eat items such as wheat or apples from her lap. This is known as the imperial type and is more common outside Gaul, while the side saddle type is much more common in Gaul. Okay, that's interesting. So in Gaul, she is side saddle, but in the Roman imperial sort of context, she was more, I'm sitting and the horses are on either side of me. Um, sort of more like symmetry. So this is in Hungary, one of those Danube provinces um, during the Roman era. Um, and then here is in Rome itself. Um, okay, interesting. Yeah, this late 18th century engraving shows a wall painting of Epona once adorning the walls of the Circus Maximus in Rome. Cool. That makes sense to put it in the Circus Maximus. Because <laughs> uh, of all the horse races. Sorry, that's my dog. I'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. So, um, okay. So, Circus Maximus. Okay. Um, a large sculpture from Brigantium um, shows the goddess, so this is in Austria, shows the goddess riding side saddle on a horse while surrounded by four or more horses. This is kind of like a hybrid of the two. It's thought to be a transitional type between the side saddle and the imperial forms. Yeah. So it's sort of both. <laughs> um, okay, now the third potential type is cart type, question mark. Much less common are representations of a cart drawn by mules or horses de dedicated to Epona. One in bronze from Elysia in Bourgogne, Burgundy, um, France. It is fair to say that this would not have been recognized as an Epona had it not had a punch inscription, punched inscription. So if it weren't for this inscription, like how how the heck would we guess it's opponent? It doesn't look like any of her other depictions, because you know we saw that two types of depictions she has. Um, another opponent depiction with a cart is a large stone base relief from Bayingen. Um, this in Germany. Uh, in this case, there is no inscription, but the upper half of the monument consists of an imperial type seated opponent flanked by seven horses, while the lower part shows, to the left, a four-wheeled cart drawn by three horses, and to the right, a scene of the sacrifice of a pig in front of an altar. Although the evidence for this type is suggestive, in general, it is not possible to assert that a given depiction of a cart is associated with Epona, unless there is a confirmatory inscription. Yeah, because there are other figures that t tend to be in carts, um, so it's kind of hard to look at any cart and say it's Epona when we only have, like, two. Um, as opposed to all the other ones that we are more certain are Epona. Okay, so these are their um, their references. That's pretty cool. Okay, no, so that that was just where they found that information. Okay, so that was their way of... They like to use uh, brackets for their citations. Interesting. Okay. Um, all right, I'm going to keep this page... Well, I mean... I have I have the link to this. So let's actually look at inscriptions because I want to see inscriptions as well. This is going to be a gold mine, honestly. This this website. I'm so glad that this website exists. Um, the reason that we know Epona's name is because of the dedicatory inscriptions, mostly in Latin, a few in Greek, and through passing references in the Latin literature. Although the name Epona is clearly Gaulish, there are no inscriptions to Epona written in Gaulish. Oh, that's a that's a shame. Um, it's my dog again. All right. 
apologies again. <laughs> okay, okay. So, um, Sentendre inscription. Yeah, Sentendre because it's an SC because it's hung Hungarian. <laughs> okay, so, um, Yeah, many of the opponent inscriptions are regular Roman altars with a carved focus on top for libations or other offerings. Okay, and the inscription on the front face. The sides may be carved or, in many cases, are plain. Here our representative selection of opponent inscriptions is presented. Okay. Yeah, they're not going to give us all of them, just a selection. Okay. Um, this is in Hungary. Alkisia Castra, um, Camino Tomet, Ponate Kinai, Julius Vitur, Equus Vexillarius, Cohortis, Nos, Vina Maicor, Cortina Maestro, Ordem Salvitorium, Vina Nordem Turma, Votum Salviti, in Spirito, Imperiatore, Domino Nostro, Cortinano, Pompei, Consul. Okay, so um, if you're wondering, um, I'm not. They, they give a translation here, um, or a translation of it's like the gist, basically. Um, if you're wondering why there's so many parentheses here, uh, what's going on is in a lot of Roman inscriptions there are sort of formulaic phrases that get used that they would just abbreviate. It's so like VSLM here. Votum solvit libens merito. Um, it's sort of a formula that's saying like um, uh, sorry, my brain is having a moment. It it's um I'm not sure how to phrase this. It's like the the way to say that you're hoping that you're um, your offering is like not your offering, but your your votive in, uh, inscription is what's the word? I apologize. I'm having a moment today. Um, I'm very distracted by my dog <laughs> right now. Um, the the point is, it's a it's a um formulaic phrase that shows up on most votive uh, inscriptions or many in in some way shape or form yeah you see it down here too Voltum solvit libens merito um it's like this is why i am doing it this I, i'm offering it for this reason um and in hope that it will be accepted if that makes sense. Um, we'll see it on, yeah, another one. Voltum Solvit Libens. Sometimes it appears slightly differently, but it's so it's so formulaic that they would just abbreviate it. VSLM or VSL or, um, yeah. Um, and some of these other ones too, these are common abbreviations for these words. Like COH, there aren't many I mean, there are other words that COH could be short for, but cohortis makes sense after equus wexilari. So the actual inscription just says ec wexi co. Um, but none of those are Latin words. Like, those aren't, <laughs> those aren't Latin words by themselves. Um, but we can tell what word they were trying to say <laughs> with that. Um, and that's sort of what you see with all these, uh, all these parentheses. These are abbreviations that are widely recognized and easy to fill in. Um, for people who work with Latin inscriptions. Um, so that's why. It's like we know what they were saying and we know what things they're short for, typically. There are some places where it's like, a, hmm, I wonder what this is short for. Usually they'll put question marks. But if, if you don't see question marks, we are fairly certain we know what, um, what they were trying to say. Um, so that's why we have all these parentheses everywhere. Um, um, so the parentheses are just to have it be like, you know, actual legible Latin instead of the like kind of just here's a few letters on the inscription um, that we had the space to write and we knew that you knew what it said. Um, all right. So that's interesting that we find that in Hungary. Um, 
the spirit of the squadron, yeah, genio tormai. Um, to the spirit of the, yeah, genius tormai would be the spirit of the squad. Um, and to Epona. Here given the additional opposite of queen, yeah, regina. Epona y regina is like to Epona, the queen. Um, the military unit is a cohort of mounted archers. Okay, makes sense to um, uh, give the inscription sort of dedicate the inscription to Epona then if you're mounted archers. Um, this altar from Thuring, um, Germany, is dedicated by an ala. Auxiliary cavalry wing, yeah. Um, Campestribus, okay. Campestribus et Eponae ala. Unum. Um, singularium. Pia fidelis. Quium Romanorum qui praest, praest, Aelius Bassanius praefectus voltum solvit libens merito. Okay. Um, yeah, and they give the inscription um, translation here to the gods of the parade found, oh, sorry, ground, parade ground, the Campestribus. Often we find like matronae campest. Uh, matrona campestribus or mat matres campestribus which are like mothers of the plague parade ground um they're sort of another sort of like equestrian type uh cults that we find the first uh core of equitas singulares pious loyal formed of roman citizens and led by the prefect of the in fulfillment of a vow yeah that's that's one way to translate this votum solvi libens merito in fulfillment of a vow the vow is votum because it, we call it a votive inscription because it's like dedicated to someone um, um okay and we have this one in scotland this one's in scotland uh yeah the most northerly epona dedication and comes from a roman fort built just west of where the river kelvin crosses the line of the antonine wall okay so she's in scotland um in the Roman fort. So this suggests that she's, she, like, this isn't like a, oh, Epona was also worshipped by the Celtic-speaking people of Britain. We don't know that for sure. Uh, but we do know that the Romans brought her cult up there. Or, like, the people in the Roman army did. Um, we'll see exactly who brought it up. Um, Marti Minervae Campestribus Herculi Eponae Victoriae Marcus Coqueius Firmus Centurio Legionis. Um, um, okay, so the altar is dedicated to Mars Minerva, the go the goddess of the playground, the parade ground. Yeah, Campestribus. Um, goddesses of the parade ground. Hercules, Hercule, Epona, and Victoria. Um, by Marcus Coqueius. Um, Cocceus Firmus, a centurion in the Second Legion, and most likely a member of the arm, Emperor Marcus Aurelius's bodyguard. Okay, that's cool. Um, so he was in her among all these other deities. Saint Reine. Um, Saint Reine. Um, Dea Eponae. Dea Eponae Satigenus uh, Solemnis Filius Votum Solvit Libens. To the goddess Epona. Satigenus, son of Solemnis, will willingly fulfill this vow. Yeah. Um, it is likely that the lettering was applied after purchase rather than by the same metal worker who created the bronze plaque. So this was on a bronze plaque. Interesting. Okay. Um, then we have a Greek one. Okay. This inscription from Aptat in Bulgaria is one of the few inscriptions in Greek. It does not name Epona explicitly, but is carved on an imperial type stone based relief of Epona, seated between two horses. So it's probably Epona based on the what it's a picture of, uh, what it's a or like a base relief of. Um, but like um, it doesn't actually say her name. What does it say? It says Teon okay, so it's to a goddess. Um Teon Epekon Alios uh, Padlin Os Anete um, Os Anete um, I don't know why I'm reading that in Atticus it's, <laughs> as if it's not going to be pronounced super different in this time period um, 
Okay, so this person has given this image to the auspicious goddess, and it's on a plaque of what looks like a Pona, so that's probably who the suspicious goddess is. Also, her being auspicious um, is interesting because of um, the name that they said in the Botanic article that they also gave her in the Imperial period, which was Augusta in Latin, um, the august goddess Epona, Augusto Sacrum Dei Eponae. We see that here. Um, yeah. Interesting. Was originally raised in the Gauls, but units recruited locally when they were stationed in one place for any length of time. The native language of this dedicant was clearly Greek, spoken in preference to Latin in the eastern parts of the empire, but a dedication is made to Epona as one of the deities of the unit. Okay, uh, now we're back in France, Bologna. Um, yeah, to the august goddess Epona, uh, Cononia, son of uh, Ecotascus, gave this temple with all its decor at his own expense. You know, like, leave it in yeah. um, <laughs> And it's dated to the early 2nd century. Okay, interesting. Other temples at Interanum were dedicated to Jupiter, Apollo Borbo, to Mithras, and to an unknown deity. But a temple was built in, on or close to the source of the river Noah the course of which formed the northwestern edge of Idui territory. Okay, we have another one. August goddess Epona, Marcellus, um, son of Maturus, in this place, freely at his own expense, valiant, uh, yeah, blah, 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 blah. Um, okay, and this one is in Lombardia, Italy. A rustic calendar inscribed on stone mentions the feast of Epona. Okay. Quindicin calendas januarius Eponae. Okay. Cool, 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 cool. So these are some inscriptions. Um, literature. Mm -hmm. This is the juvenile. Oh, they're giving more context. Love to see context. Um, Decimus Junius Juvenalis wrote 16 satires, and in one of them he mentions Epona. Um, yeah, so single drivers sharing their daily stable routine and worshipping their deities at a sacrificial rite at the altars of Jupiter. He refuses to swear an oath by any other deity than Epona, um, or some other figure painted on the walls of sickening stables. The small social gaffe of driving one's own carriage is a deliberately anticlimactic satirical device. Okay. This is translated by Green. Um, okay. Stop looking at the wall. King of the Dragon on the way of a constable. But so he'll sacrifice a dun steer and eat the shear and As ancient ritual prescribes, he swears at Jove's high altar by Epona, whose pictures doth on the doors of his reeking stables. Interesting. All right, the Golden House of Peleus. Um, okay, interesting. These thoughts were interrupted by my matching sight of a statue of the goddess Epona, seated in a sh small shrine centrally placed, where a pillar supported the roof beams in the middle of a stable. And the, yeah, okay. Um, the statue had been devotedly garlanded with freshly picked roses. So in an ecstasy of hope on identifying this assurance of salvation, I stretched out my forelegs with all the strength I could muster. I rose energetically on my hind legs. This tells us that small shrines were made to Epona, not just in the temples, but also in stables, presumably to protect the horses and asses in them. Okay. Um, this example of Epona is a stable is discussed further in the section of Epona in Stables. Oh, we have a whole section of Epona in Stables. That's cool. Um, the Octavius Minucus Felix. So, so there's some other things that I mentioned Epona that the uh, World History article didn't talk about. Prudentius in 380, 40, Okay, there's a lot. There's actually a lot of mentions of her. Um, more than, I mean, it's, this isn't a lot by modern standards, but this is a lot by ancient standards. Like. She shows up in all of these different Roman, um, uh, yeah. So, oh, this is under worship. Okay. So, like, how was she worshipped? Who worshipped Epona? Em, em, Epona temples, Epona in the home, Epona in stables. Let's look. 
who worshipped Epona. Epona seems to have been a protector of horses and were worshipped by people whose primary job function or livelihood depended on horses. Examples include cavalry. Naturally, Epona was more popular among the cavalry ally um, than among infantry. Scouts, dispatched riders, mule drivers, carters, stable hands, and grooms. At all periods of the Roman Empire, the cavalry was primarily formed from foreign auxiliaries rather than Italian troops. Yeah, they liked to bring in Germanic and Celtic um, uh, soldiers um, a lot of the time. So the ethnic composition of these cavalry units were quite mixed. I'm mean, in 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 Europe. They they pulled from all over the place generally, um, but cavalry they liked they liked them to be Germanic or Celtic most of the time um, in the European arena, the Northern European arena. Um, most were not Roman citizens, although they would gain the citizenship after 25 years of service. Some units, however, did hold the citizenship, um, which was awarded to individuals or even complete units for cons, um, conspi conspicuous, I think this book is see here, conspicuous bravery. Oddly, Gauls are not especially prominent in these units, but troopers originally from Germania and Feriard are strongly represented. Okay, yeah, Germania and Feriard had a lot of Celtic tribes. Um, the maps show few Epona representations. The maps. Oh, distribution. Okay, they have a distribution page too. Okay. It's so clustering in like Eastern France in Germany mostly, but pretty spread out. Lots of Epona. Yeah, the first distribution map shows all the Epona inscriptions or depictions of a lot. Side saddle depictions in red, imperial in green. So side saddle is by far the most, like, I mean, when you look at the cluster here, it's making up the bulk. Um, other types of depictions, including ones where the type is not currently known, are in gray. Um, a white ring indicates an inscription. I can't really see if there's a white ring. Oh, it's oh, they're talking about the second one. Okay. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, let's go back. So we're looking at wh who worshipped her. Um. So people involved with horses. Yeah, makes sense. Um. Mostly not Gauls. Not especially prominent. The map shows Epona representations in the province of Germania and Federa itself. This is an important finding and seems to indicate that Epona was worshipped not so much because she was a native goddess familiar from before joining the army, but because she formed part of the cultic esprit du corps of some of the Roman army units. So she just kind of took off like worshipping her kind of boomed with the Roman army coming in. Um, this aspect is especially notable in the case of the emperor's mounted bodyguard, originally called the Germani Corporis Custodes, and later formed as the Equitas Singularis Augusti. The latter were so much associated with the Germanic origin that they were frequently called the Batavi, the name of the German Germanic tribe living on, the island in, on an island in the Rhine near the North Sea coast. Yeah. Um, Ex-members of this unit would emphasize their high status and level of access to the emperor by dedicating altars to the group of deities of the Equitas Singularis Augusti, including Epona, the Campestres, and the Matres Sulevii, um, Sulevii, and by using particular loyal phrases and inscriptions such as Domini, uh, Domini Nostri, our lord, referencing the emperor. Okay, so big in the military, but also other people who work with horses. The Romans were very accepting of other deities, um, regardless of origin, provided they were worshipped in what was considered an appropriate manner. Thus, in general, Epona was worshipped in the same way as any other Roman deity, praying by making vows, dedicating altars in fulfillment of a vow, erecting temples, um, sacrificing animals, incense, or wine. Temples were set up, although in Gaul, these would be the uh, Gallo-Roman Eponym type rather than the classical type. A taller central uh, kella surrounded on all four sides by a covered walkway. The constructed Gala Roman Panum and the Archidrome in France. Okay. 
Um, sacrifice of animals, incense, and libations of wine were made in this in the customary Roman manner, the same as other deities. Libations were made by pouring wine from a special shallow dish called a patera. Yeah, the two silver paterae, one inscribed to Epona and one with what is assumed to be an Epona depiction, are known from Montrudnik. Uh, Montrudnik. Yugoslavia. <laughs> Just say Serbia. All right. Are now in the Museum of Belgrade. <laughs> Many side style depictions of Epona show her holding a patera in her right hand. Okay. Um, okay. In the home. Several Epona descriptions. Um, depictions are small, portable bronze or pipe clay figurines. These were probably used in a domestic or workplace shrine, or indeed in the Lararium, the shrine which each family, uh, which each home and found in each home, <laughs> and attended to by the pater familias or head of household, who also acted as a priest for the whole family in their daily devotions. Molded pipe clay figures were cheap to make and widely available. Bronze figures would be used by the more wealthy. One beautifully sculpted bronze figure of Epona from Ra, uh, Ras um, has her eyes uh, picked out in silver. Interesting. Can you link to a picture of it, please? Um, Epona in stables. The worship of Epona in stables is described in that thing we just read on the other page. Um, this tells us that small shrines were made to Epona, not just in temples, but also in stables, presumably to protect the horses and asses in them. This is confirmed by archaeology. Several Epona artifacts found have been found in Roman stables, such as the inscriptions in the stables of the Praetorium of the governor at Apulum, Apulum um, modern Alba Iulia, in, uh, in Romania. Um, the worn side saddle Epona found on a cobble floor, but believed to have been part of a stable of Bombier. Um, another side saddle Epona found in the stable. Um, from Meinhaupt um, in the Golden Ass. The carved depiction is enclosed in a small shrine and fixed the main pillar that supports the roof. Um, painted images of Epona on stable walls are also known. One is described in the Eighth Satire of Juvenal, and this is, uh, is confirmed by a similar painting on a wall of the Kirkus Maximus in Rome. We saw that picture. Um, Apuleius tells us that it was customary to decorate such depictions with flowers in the case in this case fresh flowers presumably this was well known among the general population well enough known among the general population that finding an opponent shrine uh, could be introduced in the story as a way to get the needed horses now that despite the non-temple location the small shrine was still considered sacred taking the flowers or other offerings could be considered sacrilegious okay so we have learned a lot from this source. And I am actually going to come back to taking notes on this source because there's just so much. Um, so <laughs> I'm not going to keep that keyboard smash there. Um, but I do want to um, let's go put dot, 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 because there's a lot that I'm going to get from this website. Um, and I'll make sure to look into their sources that they link to. Um, now, in um, the Gaulish Polytheist chat that I'm in, I also found links to um, some other things that are written by modern, uh, like, current practitioners who worship uh, Epona. And I wanted to take a look at some of that just to see, like, what kinds of things are they emphasizing in the modern practice that they have with Epona um, and see, like, what we can find um okay interesting okay so this is deomercurio.be um it's a lot of different gods and goddesses on this red bar this is going to be useful for later um colored image of a pony riding side saddle she carries a basket of fruits this is after a reef from Dahan. So who made this? No, this didn't work. This link didn't work. Um, 
who punishes the goddess who considers herself with the protection of horses. Pseudo Plutarch. Um, yeah, notes. All right, opponent is before all us, the horse goddess of the Gauls. This assertion is confirmed by the goddess's iconography. She's almost obligatory, obligatorily depicted with one or more equines by the etymology of her name and by what little we know of her mythology. Okay, so of the Gauls, I think it makes sense to say for a Gaulish polytheist, um, although what we did see was that most of the people um, worshipping her, uh, if we go back to worship, were... Um, Uh, most of the Roman military um, Gauls were not especially prominent in the units. Um, that doesn't mean she wasn't worshipped with Gaul. We can tell a lot of her cult is in Gaul if we go back to the maps page. Um, but um, it's just something to note as well. Epona was the Celtic goddess who gained the most success among the Romans. She was much worshipped by the Gaulish cavalry, whom the Romans greatly admired, and which was made up of the cream of the native aristocracy. The descendants of this equestrian elite later contributed to make up a prestigious unit of the Roman army, the Equitus Singulus Augusti, or Emperor's Own Horse Guard, although those tended to be Germanic. Um, as it happened, these players were miserable and spreading the worship of Epona. Yeah, they tended to be Batavian, um, but um, whom they continued to venerate in the city of Rome as in the provinces. Her cult continued to spread, reaching even the most humble stables of Greece by the second century. Uh, the goddess's name means simply the great mare. Yeah, so it's ep epos and then the augmentative suffix on. Also found in Ritona and lots of other names. Mapono's great son. Yeah, so I was saying that earlier, like that ona ending also in onos. It is usually augmentative if it has any meaning at all. Oftentimes it just means the one who is blank. But um, it could also have this augmentative meaning of the great X. So here it's like the great horse. And feminine here so great mare makes sense as a translation there um yeah, these are cognates we've got latin equus um equus and then we have uh hippos in greek um all right uh so depiction description why can't i read today description of the goddess epona is most often dedicate what is wrong with me i keep seeing d words and mixing them up with each other um, opponent is most often depicted riding side saddle. Yes, we saw that. Um, often she touches her steed's mane. It is normally a mare with her left hand in which she may alternatively hold a cornucopia. In her right hand, she holds a patera, a ritual offering dish, or a basket of fruits or loaves. A foal sometimes accompanies the mare, particularly in the Iduan country. There's a link here. Oh, I did not mean to actually click that. But the link doesn't work. No. All right. This is what Nantonos, Aidui, and Kefil, the authors of the excellent site Epona.net, define as the site saddle type. Yeah. Uh, we read that. Um, okay. Epona's attributes can also be found with other deities. Yeah. Fruit basket, cornucopia, yeah. The Lares, Matronae, Mealenia, yeah. And Abundantia. Okay. Um, number of sections points to a connection between Napoleon and the other world. Some elements of her iconography that have been interpreted this way are capable of alternate interpretations, such as the occasional depiction of a key or a raven. However, the presence of reliefs of Epona in funerary context seems decisive. Does Epona, the divine writer, leave the soul of the departed to its new home, thus acting as a psychopomp? It may be remarked that the role of the psychopomp, so often reserved for Mercury in Roman context, barely registers as an important characteristic of the Gaulish Mercury. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, it's the whole page for Mercury isn't there. Yeah. But yeah, from what I remember, Gaulish Mercury doesn't have quite as much of a psychopompic um, function. He's more... Um, you know, more commerce-y. Um, traveler -y. But not so much, um, not so much leading souls to the underworld, um, like we see in other Mercury cults. Um, so yeah, maybe like Epona's kind of taking on that role. Um, so that's interesting. Um, yeah, this is a very long article, and it, it's kind of synthesizing a lot of what we read in the Epona.net resource. Um, 
characteristics of her worship. Okay, yeah. Again, yeah, Epona Regina. We saw Epona Augusta. Um, titles for her. Queen, August. Um, entourage. We have the Campestres. Um, deities of the field. Hmm. Oh, these are cool little icons. I like these. <laughs> these little horses. Um, counterpart in the Isles. Okay, now we're looking at um, insular Celtic sources for much later. Yeah. Um, Maha, an Irish goddess whose legends connect her in the home in one hand with the Morgan, uh, on the other with the city of Eman Maha, the ritual capital of the kingdom of Ulster. Antona. Yeah, we saw that. <laughs> Lots more there. All right. Lots of references, too. Okay, this is going to be a lot to go through. So, this is going to take some time to synthesize. Now, the last thing I wanted to take a look at was this page. Uh, this is uh, page sort of summarizing Epona, Cis, yeah, Nemeton, Segomaros, um, Segomaros, we uh, Gaulish polytheist. Um, and this is what they have to say about Epona. Meaning of names. Scholars give various, um, yeah, translation of the name. Olmsa translated as horse goddess, great mare. Um, on Epona, that translated as divine mare, or, or she who lives like a mare. Uh, gives divine horse or horse goddess, yeah. Um, okay. Gives us other names in Regana and its Latin equivalent Regina, both mean queen. Um, more doubtfully, he also gives us Atanta, Tibonia, Dunna, Uesia, Catona, Epotia, Eponina, and Imona from his translation of the Rom inscription. However, this translation is not generally accepted among scholars. Uh, Caesar Serif mentions Meduna, a name derived from the Gaulish word for mead. As a binary for Epona, on Epona and Alice, you mentioned the Latin Regina. Yeah. Um, no exact equivalent in Roman uh, interpretation, but Epona was herself the subject of an official Roman worship from 50 onward. Maha. Equivalent is an interesting word to choose. I would not do that. Um, also, Indo European equivalent. I mean, the, the root for her name would be H1, E, uh, and then it's a labialized K, so the W would be uh, floating. O N E H two is the ending that they want here, not long A. Um, and Indo European mare, mead, and um, sovereignty goddess. What's their what's their link to? Sereth deep ancestors. Okay, yeah. So the case of Sereth, uh, case of Sereth is given the P I E here. It's interesting. Um, yeah, like that's those parts I would put together to explain where her name comes from. I don't know that this was a name in Proto-European though. I don't, I can't think of, I can't think of cognate goddesses with this exact name. Yeah, no, I can't. Um, if, if someone knows of any, uh, that would be cool. Um, but yeah, I'll type what that would look like in um, uh, Swords. Um, that would be H1, um, yeah, that's what it would be, like, component of, and it would be, this is the root for horse, um, and then this is, like, the origin of that Celtic augmentative there, and then this is a feminine ending in Proto-Indo-European now. Um, again, I, I can't think of any other, like, apart from Epona in the Celtic, um, in the, in the Gallic language, which would come from a, this is what the Proto-Celtic um, would look like. Oops. And that's probably where they got that long A from. It's like, it's, it's a long A in Proto-Celtic. Um, 
uh, apart from that, I can't think of any any other cognate goddesses that have this form formation with these Indo-European roots. Um, okay, um, realm, upper world goddess. Okay, this, this kind of goes with like the the whole like upper world, other world, underworld thing that a lot of Gaulish polytheists have in their cosmology. Um, Epona is depicted in two main ways, side saddle, mountain, yeah, we, okay. Just kind of reflecting what we talked about. White cloth, okay, she's often depicted with a dog, a key, a foal, or a mappa, white cloth. Um, Kondratiev identifies her with the Welsh Mariluid, Mariluid, sorry, not Luid, um, great mare, a sort of hobby horse. It was taken up by mummers during the Christmas season. Okay. From this, she interprets her as a sovereignty goddess, the land goddess, and the mother of the child, child of light, Maponos, in this view. That would identify Epona with Modron in Welsh. That's interesting. Um, he identifies her with the winter. Gesisev sees her in the European equivalent, um, Hekwana. Uh, as a horse or sovereignty goddess as well, but also sees her as possessing associations with untamed sexuality and a pure power that's potentially dangerous. Okay, I don't have deep ancestors, but that's... I want to see why. <laughs> what, what's leading to that? Okay, the Italian scholar Carlo Ginsberg um, sees her as a prototype of the later deity the little later deity of the medieval Diana cults, and as such, the leader of the wild hunt. Medieval Diana cults. Okay, sometimes something that fits with Kondratiev's identification of her with Mari Luit. The writers of Epona.net is not generally willing to go so far, seeing all such elaborate theologies as unproven. Oh, that's reasonable, I think. Uh, Morpheus Ravenna, in her upcoming book of the Great Queen sees her as a sovereignty goddess more or less directly cognate with the Irish Macha or Roech um, sharing even by names by names with Maha and like her possessing martial and f uh, fertility attributes um, when they're saying shared by names I think it's like Maha being associated with the um, Morrigan which means great goddess and then Regina is the title for um, Epona, god, uh, like, queen, um, on August, Augusta, like, okay, great queen, and then we've got great queen, um, but, of course, Maha is not the only Morrigan in Irish mythology, there's several different, um, goddesses that have that title or share that title, um, all right, possessing martial and fertility attributes, as well as the aforementioned sovereignty function. She sees some of the differences between the Gaulish and Irish figure as due to the effects of Romanization in emphasizing the less martial attributes of an existing goddess. That seems backwards a little bit to me. In her upcoming book, like her book's not out as of the, oh wait, this is 2015. So maybe it's out now. Um, book of the Great Queen, unpublished manuscript. Does this exist? Yeah, it, it's, it's available now. Um, interesting. Barnes and Noble, Indiegogo. Okay, cool. This is a review on Patheos.com. Um, it's on Google Books, even. Came out later that year. Interesting. Okay. Um, okay. So this is from 2015. So maybe maybe the views of this goddess have changed, but this is still like largely based on stuff that we have read in the in the sources. So this person is taking um, their view of Epona, um, or at least like the the sources about her, into account um on their description of her here um and there's some other stuff that we haven't read like there's this uh deep was it deep ancestors 
book um, or looking at Olmsted. Um, it's a really widely cited book for um, uh, Celtic mythology. And then we've got Charles Ginsburg deciphering a witch's Sabbath. Interesting. Um, okay, but this is still interesting to see, um, like what attributes from what we've read are being sort of synthesized by this modern Gaulish, pre um, this this example of a modern Gaulish um, practitioner, um, worshiper. Um, okay, so I think we got a good start on this stuff. I'm gonna definitely be going through these sources more deeply and seeing like where their information comes from, what I want to include, um, and yeah so this is exciting this also has lots of citations um so i'm very interested to get more information about that but sort of my process i i sort of make sure i i mark for myself so that i could easily get back to where i did it especially when things go multiple pages um which often happens with sources i'll like go multiple pages of like quotes and stuff to mine um uh and then i can get back to them more easily but I like to put my citation first so that that's already done. <laughs> so that when I then go and cite it in my writing, I already have this to put in my work cited pre-done. I do that when I'm there on the website so I don't have to go back to the website again and be like, oh wait, when was it written? When was it published? This is a pretty old source here, 2004 to 2007. Um, so all their research is gonna be up to that point unless they've um, updated it further um, since then. Um, but if it hasn't been, actually, I want to look at their bibliography and see if there's any later sources. Because there might be, you know, there may have been more finds archaeologically. There may be more um, scholarly discussion about her since, you know, 2007. Um, so that all would need to be taken into account when using that source. Are there any more recent ones here? This one is 2008. That's a translation of the time. Um, hmm. I can't tell when this one was written. Oh wait, yes I can, it says so. Interesting flags that we've got here um, to change the language of the page. Um, okay. Post RC. Seven. <laughs> what? Post RC seventeen uh seventy one. I don't know what RC stands for, so I don't know what date they're trying to put here. Uh, let's go to home. Maybe they'll have the date there. <laughs> In a more conventional um uh way of writing the year. <laughs> What is post RC? Okay, no, on the site's period. Okay, for some reason we rolled out a mobile version in early 2014. We hope you like it. For the same reason, okay. Under one Omega. Okay, so last time they updated the website was 2014, I guess? 2012, 2014? Um, but what is this year? Post RC. What could RC stand for? Um, and then there's that formula. That we were looking at earlier. Votum solvit libens merito. Um, so it's like it's like a dedication to Mercury, Keteris, gods and goddesses, the immortal gods and goddesses. Interesting. Okay. I know post RC 17. Oh, this is a different year. Okay. Weird, okay. Oh, it says so, oh, they're explaining it up here. Okay, so 
on a post Romanum Conditam. Okay. Romam Conditam. Since the founding of Rome. Um, the other, I would create this website in 2009, lo and behold, I have fulfilled it. Okay, so the site was finished in 2009. Um, is that what it said on the last page? XXI, okay. No, um, different date. Okay, but is that the date for this page, or is that just they didn't update the website? Bot. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> but we'll find other sources through this source if I can't end up citing its year. Um, we'll see. Um, okay, but we'll stop there because it is now eleven minutes after when this um, stream was supposed to end. But I've done a lot of reading about Epona. I've learned a lot more about her inscriptions. I'm very excited. Thank you to the people who shared. Um, in, in Gull Chat, thank you to the people who shared these links um, so that I could find this stuff on Epona. It's very exciting. So, um, thank you anyone who was watching the stream. Um, thank you for um, watching this if you're in the future on YouTube, uh, catching up. Um, I hope you also learned some stuff about Epona with me today. Um, and I will see you all in two weeks uh, for another sort of Conlang stream. Uh, but um, reminder that links to things are in the description, including Patreon and stuff. So, uh, I appreciate everyone, uh, who is here and who will be here. Um, you can always still comment in the description. If I got something wrong today, please let me know, um, in my commentary. Um, I might've totally done so. So, uh, I would appreciate that as well as any comments you have. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of whatever time zone you're in and I'll see you next time. Farewell.